um, I was in a bone scan machine uh, because initially um, I had a problem with my hips and a, a groin injury that wouldn't heal. And so at that time we were still looking at my abdomen and my pelvis and I was laying in the bone scan machine and the technician just casually made a comment about, well, have they found your source tumor yet? And when she said it, like I still, it still brings emotion. Like I felt this shock run up my body and it was like, oh my God, she just told me it, it is for sure cancer and it's in two places. It was revealed that the cancer was uh, sensitive to estrogen, progesterone, and it had a Herceptin II marker. The source tumor wasn't very large, but it was aggressive. And by the time it was discovered, it had already metastasized to my hip bones. As a matter of fact, the pain in my leg was the first indicator that there was a problem. I am one woman among hundreds of thousands of women who are learning to be courageous and to overcome and to live in the face of cancer. My name is Jan. I was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer in June of 2009. Well, I guess the very first memory that I have is the doctor saying something about suspicious for a tumor and then he left the room and I remember just laying back on the examination table and the ceiling tiles coming up and uh, the very first thought honestly that crossed my mind was thank God I have insurance that was the very first thought I had and then just quickly followed by uh, thoughts about my children I definitely remember um, just the sensation of having the wind sucked out of my lungs, like definitely as a sucker punch or a, um, something that stops you mid-stride. And then as you begin to breathe again, there's this one million questions that circle your mind. There's all these what is and thoughts and impacts. And if you have any kind of strategy about your thinking, like you're looking ahead and it's, you know, red lights everywhere. And I left the doctor's office that day, uh, scheduled the following Monday, that was on a Thursday, and the following Monday for some additional bone scans and procedures, and um, that was a stressful weekend. And I spent a lot of time with my husband that weekend just talking about and coming to grips with, this is probably the real deal. Like, I, I knew before I knew. So I started chemo in the fall, and I had um, seven rounds of the traditional adromycin, cytoxin, Taxotere. I did Avastin and Herceptin. Um, of course, I had all of the nausea drugs and the Benadryl and the steroids. It was an all-day procedure every three weeks. But I found the chemo chair to be really not such a bad place. Like, for me, I learned to think about chemo as a artificial immune system. If my own immune system wasn't going to do the job, then chemo was going to be an immune system for me. And rather than dreading all the side effects or thinking about how hard it might be, I chose to just think about it as my friend and my ally. As soon as I came home from the hospital that day and I knew what I was dealing with, uh, Mark and I went into the bedroom and we shut the door and we agreed we needed to tell our children first. So we called in our 19-year-old daughter, and her name is Ashley, and um, I shared with Ashley what was going on. And that was difficult all by itself because Ashley and I walked through the loss of one of my very best friends in 2006 from breast cancer. Luke was 12 at the time, and uh, Luke was very sensitive. And I remember Luke giving me a hug and crying for a moment and asking a couple of simple questions like, you know, when are you gonna to go to the doctor, or something like that. Again, kind of gentle processing, and we just took our time and we got through it. Some of my favorite stories are about John and his friends. One of the uh, first things that happened in the first few weeks is it was uh, summertime when I was diagnosed and he and his friends all shaved their heads in honor of me. And some of them didn't shave their heads but put my initials in their hair. And, they gathered up one afternoon at somebody's house and had a hair shaving party in my honor. And that, you know, blessed my socks off. And it blessed my son. The thing that Matthew did for me is that was late at night. It was getting to be in the evening. And I went to bed that night before the rest of the family. I was so exhausted. 
And uh, it's typical for me, I woke up early the next morning and I wandered into the kitchen. And down at the end of the bar where Matthew would normally eat a bowl of cereal in the morning were some papers and some magic markers. And laying on the counter was a little sheet of paper and he had um, done a, like a little poster and it said, she will survive. I realized that my family needed me. I realized I had some things I wanted to do that I wasn't finished with yet. And I realized that if I didn't get a grip on fear, it was gonna kinda get a grip on me. I learned that I, there was something inside me that once I realized uh, how important it was for me to move through the process, it gave me the courage that I'd never had before. Like something kind of warrior-like arose in me. And I just wasn't willing to lay down. So don't let fear keep you from moving forward. Don't let it steal your joy in the season. Don't let it make you um, dread what's to come. Don't let it talk to you about how hopeless it might be or how the fight's too big or how it might take too much or you won't have the resources or whatever you're afraid of. In a way, you have to sort of just do it in spite of the fear. And then the fear becomes, you know, a catalyst for courage.